John says, After this there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be healed? And the sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I am going, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Get up. Take your bed and walk. And at once the man was healed and he took up his bed and he walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, It is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, The man who healed me, that man said to me, Take up your bed and walk. And they asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk. Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn, as there was a crowd in the place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you are well. Sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father is working until now, and I am working. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Now the rest of chapter 5 is a, uh, is a long dialogue, basically, um, that Jesus, um, it, it's a continuation of Jesus' response to those leaders, and I would encourage you to read that. It's very, very, very good. But I want to have us move down for the sake of time today to chapter 6, beginning in verse 1, where we read this. John says, After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Lifting up his eyes then and seeing what a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they for so many? And Jesus said, Have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. Jesus then took the loaves and When he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, Gather up the leftover fragments that none, that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, This is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. This is the word of the Lord for us this morning. I want to pray real fast. Father, we thank you for your word. And uh, I ask God that you would come now and um, give us uh, spiritual ears to hear spiritual eyes to see. Uh, Lord, we know that this is a work that only your Spirit can do inside of us. I am probably more acutely aware of, uh, of our own insufficiency and our limitations this morning as I stand here 
in this empty room thinking of others on the other side of computer screens and TV screens and cell phone screens, how uh, weak and limited we really are. And so, Father, I pray that you would come and use your word and use my words to bring yourself honor and glory and to uh, do a work in people's hearts this morning in a way that only you can do. So I pray that, Father, and I trust you to do it. And I love you. In Jesus' name, amen. So hey, in our, in our two passages today, um, there's two things basically happening at, at a basic level. Uh, Jesus uh, basically heals a lame man, and then he feeds a hungry crowd, right? That's the two things you see Jesus doing. And both of these stories are filled with um, awe and wonder, power. It's the awe and the wonder and the power of Jesus himself uh, over our pain and our suffering and over our fears and our, our deepest longings and our our unsatisfied hungers. I think that the reality is that every one of us probably knows a little bit about what it's like uh, to live with a real deep sense of unsatisfied hunger, a deep sense of this truth that our, our physical bodies uh, really are wasting away day by day. Um, and it's really in those two really deep places of hunger, these deep places of longing, these deep places of physical limitation that Jesus meets us today. In our first text in chapter 5, verses 1 through 18, uh, Jesus heals a lame man, right? Now the reality is this, um, sickness and disease and physical suffering are, are really Uh, just part of the human experience. And they're part of the human experience as a result of the fall of man into sin. Uh, Another way to say this is to say that sin is very much like a ferocious uh, virus that has infected every part of our existence as human beings. Uh, There's not a part of us that hasn't been touched by sin. Uh, The reality is that to be human is to be limited. Uh, To to be human is to face physical suffering at some point, regardless of your age and regardless of your nationality, regardless of your ethnicity or your gender or your social economic status. A physical suffering place, no favorites. Why? Because... Satan, sin, and the grave, death, they don't discriminate. Uh, The thing that I call the sin virus um, that has resulted in our physical suffering, it, it knows nothing about partiality. Sin affects everything within the categories of our spiritual and and emotional. And, and relational and physical well-being. Now, the, the reality is that no human being can take this journey through life without becoming infected at some level with the effects of sin. Our, our physical well-being will always ultimately be compromised at some point in this life. And you really see this front and center um, in this season for us um, as a nation as we face and struggle through this coronavirus wreaking havoc across the entire world, right? And the reality for us is even outside of having a a pandemic going on, um, we've all witnessed and experienced these physical limitations, sickness, disease, death. We've all experienced that in some way. Probably all found ourselves in a place where we've been devastated by the physical limitations that we face. Uh, Many of you, as you're listening and watching today, have most likely faced the pain of losing a loved one because of sickness and disease. Breakdowns, limitations in our physical ability. I think all of us have probably at some point faced um, our own unique battles with our own sickness, our own 
diseases or we just struggled for longer than we wanted to or expected to. Some of us are even still struggling today with physical limitations. Things like physical illness that just kind of hang on to us like some sort of a leech, right? Sucking the life out of you, sucking the energy out of you, sucking the, the joy out of your life. Many of us are in some of these places today. And really, I think the questions that all of us begin to ask as we face these physical limitations are like, how long, O Lord, are you going to leave us this way? That's a question that we intrinsically ask deep down inside. How long must I suffer? How long until you relieve my pain? When are you going to step in, God, and remove these painful circumstances? How long must I wait on you? Where can I find rest in the midst of this sin-infected, sickness-inflamed, disease-ridden world? Those are questions we ask in the deepest recesses of our souls. The beauty of this first story in John chapter 5 is that while all of our questions aren't going to get answered, there is a answer I believe can sustain us for all of eternity. Look at the text again with me. Follow along with me a bit. As you're looking at the text, you see Jesus rolls into Jerusalem, right? And he, and he stops off at this healing shelter, kind of like a hospital for people who've been devastated by the effects of sickness and disease. And John tells us that there's literally five massive shelters set up around some kind of healing pool. I think it was believed that angels would come and stir up this pool once a day and people would become healed. These five shelters were used to house the blind and the lame and the paralyzed. And one of these dudes has been there for 38 years. Can you imagine waiting for 38 years to be healed? Can you imagine waiting for 38 years for your circumstances to change? Put yourself in this man's shoes. I want you to feel this. 38 years of being carried around on your bed. 38 years of getting sponge baths. 38 years of not walking, not running, not taking a stroll in the park. 38 years of not jumping, not dancing most likely not being able to put your own clothes on. See, it's not just that this man wanted to walk for 38 years. It's that this man wanted to be able to do anything that accompanies the ability to walk. And can you imagine the overwhelming sense of desperation and even despair inside of this man? Can you visualize the myriad of things that this man was unable to do? 38 years brings a new meaning to the last couple of weeks that we've experienced in the face of a worldwide pandemic. And then in walks Jesus. Walks right into this man's most painful, most desperate of human moments. He already knows what the man's story is. Verse 6, look at that, think about that. He already knows what the man's story is. Be encouraged by this as you ponder that and think about it. There isn't a single circumstance in your life that Jesus doesn't already fully know and fully understand. Hear me out on this for, for a minute. Jesus knows. Jesus understands. And Jesus has the infinite power to change you, to heal you, to set you free from your physical limitations. And He could do this in the blink of an eye, whether in this life now or in the life to come. And in this story, Jesus does just that. He heals this lame man 
in the blink of an eye after asking him if he wants to be healed. What a miracle, right? What a miracle. But I would be remiss if I didn't mention this. Back at the text. Jesus doesn't heal everyone in the story, does he? He's in a hospital full of sick, lame, blind invalids dying. He doesn't heal them all. Why not? It's a question that I think we should ask. It's a question that deep down inside we do ask. Well, why did you provide for that person that way, but not for me? Well, why did you heal them, but not me? Vice versa. Why am I struggling with this, and they're not? But why, why was that person given that privilege, but you did not give that privilege to that person, God? Is he unfair? Is he unjust? Is he unkind? Is he not good? Did the other people in this hospital not have enough faith? Did Jesus not know their circumstances? Did God not love them as much as he loved this man? I admit those are really tough questions to answer. Again, I think they're questions that we all ask at some point, and I don't want to be dismissive of those questions in any way. I don't just want to give like Christian platitude answers, and yet, in some regard, there's not much of a place to go in the answers, is there? <coughs> so the reality is that um, I don't know all the answers to these questions, and, and really probably neither do you. It's why we, it's why we ask these questions. I mean, let me tell you this, God's big enough to handle those kinds of questions. I, we, I know that the Lord has purposes for what he allows in our lives that are way beyond our understanding. Um, one of the things I always try to remember is that while I, I don't know everything, because I'm not God, I really don't understand most things because I'm not God. Uh, one thing I can do is I can trust that Jesus does know and that Jesus does understand and that in eternity, in heaven, I'll get to see things a lot more clearly than I do now. And so that, that's part of the way that I approach it and I don't try to, I don't try to learn everything. Now, it is quite possible, I think, quite possible that Jesus healed this man while leaving the rest of the hospital to look forward to complete healing as they walk through the doors of heaven in the future. Um, I, I do think that if everybody was healed this side of heaven, there'd be no need for heaven. I mean, there's something about the suffering that we face in this life and the reality of our bodies falling apart and the limitations that we face that I think is meant to cause us to long for heaven so that we don't make this place our heaven. So I, those are some thoughts I have. I think that Jesus might have done this miracle just so that he could reveal his power, listen, his power over sickness and disease on this sin-infected earth, okay? If you think about that, if he is able to do that kind of miracle right here, right now, on this sin-infected earth, then just imagine what heaven is going to be like where there is no sickness and no disease and no death and no mourning and no pain. That's heaven. That's heaven. It's quite possible that this healing was meant to invite us into a deeper longing for the rest and the renewal that we're going to experience in heaven. Say it one more time. I think it's quite possible that this healing was meant to invite us into a deeper longing for the rest and the renewal that we're going to experience in heaven. Rest and renewal is very key for moving ahead in this text. Seems to be underscored by the rest of this text. You read that all of this took place when? When did all of this happen? Happened on the Sabbath. Sabbath, the day of rest and renewal. Well, what happened that day? Man got healed. 
couldn't walk for 38 years, is now carrying his bed home. Uh, you would think that there would be much shouting. There'd be much celebration. Right? Social media would be going crazy. Man who hasn't walked in 38 years got up off his bed. He's carrying his bed down the hallway and he's headed home. Much celebration is what you would expect. It's not the way the story goes, though, is it? What happens? I like to say, enter the enemy at this point. And there's a great correlation as we think about this to the enemy and the deceiver and the liar of our souls. Enter the enemy, verses 9 through 15. What are they? They're the religious crowd. They're the rule keepers. They are the tradition holders. They are the list makers, the checkmark counters, the legalists, the moralists, the self-righteous hypocrites, the whitewashed tombs. The brood of vipers, the horde of snakes, uh, they have their Bibles in one hand, and then in the other hand, they got their favorite commentaries that explain how to do everything in the Bible. That's what they are. That's what they have. And they can't believe this man would dare to carry his bed on the Sabbath. Who does this guy think he is anyways, right? This is, this is I'm going to do some posturing here. Who, who does he think he is anyways? Uh, doesn't this man know that doing any kind of work on the Sabbath is a big no-no? I mean, we've got laws about this that explain how to practice the Sabbath. You don't leave your house and walk any further than a thousand yards unless you have a rope tied to you and tied to your house to make that an extension of living in your house. Otherwise, that would be working on the Sabbath. You don't carry your handkerchief from the upstairs to the downstairs because that would be working. You tie it around your neck to get downstairs. Literally, guys, this is stuff that these legalistic brutus snakes would argue about. How are we going to explain this to new believers? What's this guy doing on the Sabbath? What kind of example is he setting for my family? Who let that guy in here? It's going to bring such dishonor to the Lord. He can't, he can't, can't, can't let the church run around with this kind of licentiousness running around in it, breaking all these traditional laws that we have. Somebody's got to stop this guy. Somebody's got to say something to him. I've been authorized by God to do so. Uh, never mind the fact that this man hasn't walked in 38 years. And he's now walking and carrying his bed. So here's a simple truth that I um, find I think is true throughout Scripture. Uh, legalists always turn the joy and the celebration of our freedom in Christ into heavy burdens of work. Working to keep the rules and working to keep the lists in check. I think, I'll say it again. Legalists always turn the joy and the celebration of our freedom in Christ into heavy burdens of working to keep the rules and the lists in check. A legalist looks like he's filled with joy but the reality is he's happy that he gets to keep his check marks in check and he also keeps keep his list. He's happy about that, but he's not living in the joy of the Spirit of Christ. And so it can be very deceptive when legalism begins to spring up inside of me. I can begin to get more happy about my list that I want to keep and the work that I want us to do rather than living in the joy of the freedom of Christ. Legalists will always turn joy and celebration into happy work, not joy-filled living. Oh, what an exhausting place to exist, right? What, what a pitiful place to live. Now, I would submit in this text that these legalists, they're actually more lame. They're more blind than any other person present in this story, and they can't help but to share their self-righteous pity with others. 
They love to share their legalistic virus because misery loves infecting company. It's evident. Evident in the text, by the way, these religious leaders start quizzing the healed man, right? Then once they find out who the culprit is that allowed this man to break their man-made rules, what do they do? They set out to kill the one who has the power to make the lame walk and the blind to see and the deaf to hear. Their rule-keeping, working, literally drove them into a murderous rage. I can, I can hear their sweet little voice, and oftentimes I think we get this picture of a legalist who comes up to us and they're just angry, right? They're just mean. And true, they're, oh, they are this way sometimes. But I actually think there's a real passive, kind of aggressive way about this, especially in the Christian community where we all have to be really, really nice, right? Be really, really nice in the things that you say. So here's the way that I envision kind of this, these legalists coming to us. This is the way that I envision even myself as I try to like jump into that legalistic boat. It might sound like this. Hey, uh, forgive me for asking, sir. Like, I-, I know I've made my mistakes too. Don't you know this is a day of rest though? Like, where's, where's the man who told you otherwise? See, if you think about this, but you think about the way the deceiver comes. The deceiver comes in a way that deceives you. You wouldn't know it unless you had the Spirit of God, right? I mean, the snake, the deceiver, Satan, he deceived Adam and Eve. Um, we need to find this guy. We need to find this guy. We need to make sure that he doesn't spread his diseased message any further. Oh, we, we can't have people rebelling against these clear rules that we've been following for, for a long time, right? Probably think it's best if we just, we're just going to plan to kind of take this guy out. You don't have to be a part of it, but you, can you let us know where he's at, who he is? Like, we'll take care of it for you. You don't, you don't have to be bad. We're going to stop him from hurting anybody with this horrible message that he's spread. What was that message that, that you called it? Uh, freedom? What is that? Healing? Rest? If that were true, if that were true, why why are you now sinning by carrying your bed around on the Sabbath? I think you probably need to go back and lie down by the pool, my friend. We'll we'll, we'll talk about this later. We'll talk about what he you think he did for you later. There's there's probably a great explanation for why you're walking around now. So can you hear the, the whispers of the enemy here in the midst of that? The enemy only, always wants to sideline what Jesus does. And the interesting thing is in the text, what does Jesus tell the man? He doesn't tell him he's sinning by carrying his bed. He just tells him, don't go sin now in your freedom, basically, right? Don't use your newfound freedom to sin. If this man was actually sinning by carrying his bed, who do you think would have told him that has any authority to tell him that? Jesus, right? I mean, notice what actually pushed these dirty snakes over the edge in the first place. Verses 16 through 18, look at it. It wasn't just that Jesus broke their man-made rules of Sabbath keeping. Think about a man-made rule. A man-made rule is taking something that God actually says, right, and then attaching a bunch of man-made things to that. Now, uh, the furthest extent of that in, in, in a legalistic mind is that we take things that God actually never even said, or we take obscure things that he said, right? Like, oh, don't cause your brother to stumble. What does that mean? I can't eat a big fat steak? Well, I don't get it. Like, what does that apply to? Help me understand. Well, people have got all sorts of connections to that. So what would you do then is you take one obscure passage and you, you attach to it all the things that you think make that law true. And thereby what you do is you become a legalist and you, you create categories that God never intended to speak to. Stealing, therefore, the joy of our freedom, right? So here, it wasn't just that Jesus broke their man-made rule of Sabbath keeping because God never said you can't carry your bed or a handkerchief or leave your house and walk further than a thousand feet. God never said those things. Those are man-made things. The problem in the text is that Jesus made himself equal with God. Now, easy for all of us to sit here and kind of nod our heads real quick in agreement, right? Because you can clearly see that in the text. But I want to provoke you a little bit on this one. A little bit of provocative mood this morning. Provocative in a provoking way. Yeah, just forget, scratch that from the record, okay? 
not in my notes, obviously. I'm not Holy Spirit-led, I don't think. But I do want to provoke you. I want to provoke your thinking. When Jesus says in verse 17, my Father is, the word is, that's a present tense, not was, past tense, not did, past tense, not is going to, future sense, present tense. My Father is working until now, and I am working. It's a Sabbath day. Are you following me on the provoking a little bit here? It's Sabbath day, day of rest. Day of renewal. Jesus' response is, my father is working and I am working. What the ever living heck does he mean? Because this seems to rattle my cage when you think about the idea of the Sabbath. Didn't God take a day off on the seventh day? Uh, Didn't God rest on the seventh day in Genesis? Doesn't God ask us to do the same? Now, um, hold on to your seats for a minute. Drop this idea here. Buckle your seatbelts. Did God really stop working on the seventh day? Did he really stop working? Ask this next question. If he did, before you click off on the video, okay? (laughs) If he did stop working completely on that day, then, then just answer me this one question. Who was it that held the moon and the stars and the planets in place while God supposedly stopped working. Who did that? Maybe Jesus did. No, no, bad answer, right? Bad answer because Jesus is God too. So your Father, Son, Holy Spirit um, rested that day but still worked. Surely holding the cosmos together is far more work than carrying your bed home. Agreed? Maybe the problem here, so here's the problem, I think. Now that I've provoked you a little bit, you go back and do some theological study on what the Sabbath actually means. Um, Maybe the problem here is not so much about not working as much as it is about a transformation of our working. Uh, Maybe it's simply that God entered his Sabbath rest on the seventh day in Genesis and he's actually never returned from it. God can rest completely and work completely all at the same time in his perfection. It's something that you and I probably have a hard time wrapping our minds around. We need specific days for this. Maybe God entered his Sabbath rest on the seventh day in Genesis and he never returned from it. Maybe, maybe, maybe the seventh day rest, according to Hebrews 3 and 4, was actually completely fulfilled in the finished work of Christ at the cross. Maybe this whole story is much more about the transformation of the Sabbath and our work than we actually think. And here's the thing, Uh, the religious crowd really could not believe this message. They couldn't believe in a message that actually short circuits or short changes their ability to prove their worth through their hard work of keeping their man-made rules. Couldn't see just how blind and lame they really were. No cognitive understanding of their spiritually sick conditions. Why Jesus later, another place, says... I didn't come for the healthy, those who think they're healthy. I came for those who know they're sick. So in the Christian community, we, we love to say, oh, I struggle with sin. I, I struggle with sin a whole lot, brother. A whole, a whole lot. I need you to pray for me. Oh, yeah? When? Oh, well, you know, in, in, in the past, um, yeah, I probably should go jump on a phone call now. Yeah, so we gloss this stuff over. I we figure out this weird kind of like funky, humiliative language where we never actually talk about our sickness in real terms. It's kind of like you go to the doctor and the doctor's like, so what's wrong with you? And you're like, well, you know, I just, I just been feeling a little cruddy this week. Oh, well, tell me about that. Oh, well, I just been feeling a little cruddy. I think I need to go home to my wife. That would be stupid, wouldn't it? So tell me, what, why do Christians behave this way? Why? Because we're legalists. And to admit that I actually sinned this week, that I actually lusted over a female, that I actually thought about lying, and I actually did lie about something, that I actually overate and ate too much, that I had too many beers the other night, or that I sped down the highway cussing and swearing at the guy who wasn't going fast enough in front of me, right? Like, what is the big deal with us as Christians admitting our sin? It proves that we need Jesus, that we're actually sick, and that our work doesn't do squat for us. That's why we 
don't have real conversations about our sin. We love to prove that we're better than we really are. And these legalists in this passage, they couldn't see how blind and lame they really were. They had no cognitive understanding of their spiritually sick condition. But there was one man, at least, in this passage who did understand the story of the radical transformation that gave his heart, his soul, great rest as he worked to carry his bed home on the Sabbath. So the reality of this text, as we work down to the end of it and jump into the next one, Jesus has power to heal us. It has power to help us walk in freedom. It has the power to help to transform our working into resting. So questions for you, a bunch of them. Is it possible that God, in His unique and sovereign care over you, has actually given you an opportunity to reorient your theology of work and rest and transformation in this story? Isn't it possible? Work, rest, transformation. Possible that God's given you an opportunity to rethink your theology on this. You might say, well, I'm not really a theologian. No, yes, you are if you have thoughts about God. Just a lot of us are really bad theologians. Because we're lazy, we think we don't understand, and we got better things to do. So, maybe God wants to reorient your theology, practically. But my question is, is, where are you working in your own little man-made way, your little list of rules to earn God's grace? Where do you experience, here's another way to say it, where do you experience moments of really deep, angry and frustration because someone else just doesn't follow the man-made rules you've attached to the gospel. Think about that for a little bit. Without justifying yourself for your frustration and your anger, think about that. Where is the Lord opening your eyes to your spiritually lame state right now? Where is he working to transform your heart from that of a legalist to that of a transformed son or daughter? Because a son or daughter has privileges and freedom that far surpass that of a legalist who hasn't entered the kingdom yet. Jesus has the power to heal us, to help us walk in freedom, to transform us, and are working into resting. Second passage. I'll try to blaze through this a little quicker because we're about out of time, right? It's important, though. Second passage, chapter 6, verse 1 through 15. Jesus does what? He feeds a hungry crowd. So um, one of my love languages is food. Um, most of y'all, if you know me, you know that. Love food. Mm. Mm. It's not listed in the Five Love love Languages book. I just think that the book needs to be rewritten, republished with a bunch of other love languages because I think there's more than five, one of them being food. I know my friend Chris Shade totally agrees with me, and you're on the other side of the screen going, yeah, brother, go! Yes, eat some food. As I'm speaking, I'm going to waste some time and just tell you that at home I have an awesome pork roast in a slow cooker. I'm going to go home, I'm going to eat it, and I'm going to take a big fat nap. And I'm going to love it, and I'm going to feel loved while doing so. Okay, so food. Food, I think, is a love language. It is for me. It may not be biblical, but that's my whole thing. I just now added something legalistic to the Bible. Sorry. Anyways, I do think uh, food is awesome, obviously. Uh, they always say that uh, the quickest way to a man's heart is through his what? Through his stomach, right? That's the quickest way to a man's heart. Definitely true for me, but I also know um, this. I know what it's like to go hungry. I don't know if any of you know what it's like to actually go hungry. I know what it's like to go hungry for short periods of time. I grew up in a very poor family, um, and therefore uh, we didn't always have these large tasty meals on our table. I honestly learned how to get by with a package of ramen noodles, a hot dog to chop up and put in it, with a scrambled egg mixed with that, and a glass of water. And that sometimes was my meal for a few days. And so I just, I understand, and that's better than some, a lot of people have it, to be honest with you. Um, and so I just, I grew up this way. Um, but here's the thing, even more than that, when it comes to food, I also grew up um, without a lot of things that other people take for granted. Um, so uh, if I did have friends, and I didn't have very many, um, a lot of them had new clothing. I never had new clothing at all, never. Um, didn't have shoes without holes in them. Grew up with duct tape on my shoes, keep the holes um, filled to keep water out of my shoes when I was outside. Um, I grew up without fast food primarily. Once a month, my sister and I would get to go to McDonald's, get a Happy Meal, split it. And that was once a month, possibly. <laughs> central heat. Didn't have central heat in our house. We heated our house with uh, firewood. We went and chopped down the wood, chopped it up, put it in the basement, heated our house that way. Couldn't afford the central heating unit. Uh, air conditioning. Didn't have air conditioning in our home. While other homes did, we couldn't afford it, so we didn't have it. Didn't have cable TV, didn't have a satellite TV, and again, didn't have a lot of friends because what kind of friends want to come to your house? 
Nobody wants to live in that environment when you, when you got all this other stuff over here. So that's the way that I grew up. Um, so I understand what it is like to kind of hunger for some things that you don't have. And you don't have to have the same experience that I did to identify what hunger looks like in your life. Okay, It's not, not hard for all of us to think about the ways that we attempt to feed our hearts when we're starving for something. You're starving for love, starving for affection, starving to not be lonely anymore, starving for power, for control, for security, right? Those kinds of things. And we all try to fill those or feed those starvations, those hungers in different ways. We try to manage relationships. We try to collect belongings. We try to amass wealth, acquire popularity, gain control, seek power, either aggressively or passive-aggressively. Right. Oh, we try to feed ourselves by earning job security, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The list goes on and on. The bottom line that we all have deep hungers inside of us that we are often completely aware of. So let me just ask you, what are you hungry for today? What are you hungering for the most? Because that's what makes our second story so fascinating. Now, it's a very familiar story. I'm going to try to roll through it quickly. Here's the thing. Jesus has a large crowd following him. Why are they following him? Ask that question. Why are they following? Really, they're following him because of the first three miracles that he had done. The first three signs. They loved a good show. Anybody else with me? I love a good show too. I love good entertainment. A good football game. Right? A good movie. Well made, not cheesy ones. Oh, man, right? We love a good show. We love to be entertained. These people's hearts were hungry for more. They wanted more entertainment. Jesus' traveling circus offered so much more pop and bane than the religious leaders did with their measuring sticks and their watchful eyes. Right? right? Who wants to get measured every day? Who wants to know some legalistic jerk is watching over you every day? I'd rather go where there's a bunch of really cool stuff happening, like people are getting healed. Go, go there instead. I'm going to go to a different church now. Right? Well, certainly the signs Jesus was performing were much more satisfying of an experience for people. Oh, here Jesus is. All right, he knows this. He knows what's going on. He knows the crowds are following him because they love the circus. He also knows that these religious fanatics are watching his every move. I mean, you go back and you read what he said to them uh, between the healing of the lame man and the feeding of the 5,000. I'm going to tell you, the things that he says in those verses, man, if they weren't mad at him before, they're really mad at him now. Okay? If they hadn't loaded their guns, they got their guns loaded now. Just pretty certain of it. But what does Jesus do? Take a sabbatical, build himself a house deep in the mountains. Probably what I want to do, avoid the crowds. Log cabin in the mountains. I want to go practice some social distancing. Ha, that's a funny one, right? Not really. Not really. I know. Um, no, he doesn't do any of that. What does he do? He uses the opportunity to practice some good old-fashioned discipleship. And he asks his disciple Philip what he thinks they should do about the hungry crowd. And of course, Philip, if you, if you look at what Philip does here in like verses 3, 6, and 7, now Philip only evaluates the situation uh, through his physical capacity to understand, right? He surmises that it would be very costly to feed such a large crowd. That's basically his, his uh, summary. Now, if you know the infinite costliness of the cross, so just go here with me, you know the infinite costliness of the cross looming in front of Jesus, you know what's going to happen here soon, then I think this story for us takes on a completely different shape, right? Doesn't it? Like if Jesus is willing and able to spend his life for sin-infected, lame, hungry, legalistic, and entertainment-based, infatuated, unfaithful people, and then, then how much is the lack of money in the bank, lack of food in the pantry going to stop him from showing up in a miraculous way here? Right? So we know. Next thing that happens is in, in, in steps Andrew. In steps, in steps Andrew. I <laughs> love Andrew. Uh, Andrew steps in. It's Peter's brother. Got a really audacious solution. Uh, there's a little boy with five loaves and bread, two fish. Uh, certainly this small offering isn't going to come anywhere close to satisfying the hunger in this crowd. Uh, you know, the point of that is this. Like you might think that your small offering doesn't go a long ways, but and you yourself might feel like you are a small offering. You're not that big of a deal. And the reality is none of us really are that big of a deal. 
But at the end of the day, you know what God can do with, with small amounts? He can do an awful lot. And, and we see that in this passage. You know, Jesus blesses this small offering. He distributes it miraculously. Everyone is satisfied with enough leftovers to feed many more people. How would you respond? That's the question. How would you respond if Jesus shows up in a miraculous way right now just like this? Would you believe him even more or would you be so satisfied if he showed up and removed the circumstances from your life that you would then live like you don't even need him? How would you live? I want more Jesus or you know what? I'm good now. I'm ready for a nap. don't really need you anymore. And how do the people in the text respond? To this sign. Well, John tells us that the people get really excited. They believe that Jesus is a great prophet. So Jesus does what? He withdraws because the people start planning to do what with him? They start planning to make him into some kind of human political leader. Now, that's the sense behind the word king, just so you know. They want to make him into a human political leader. Now, I'll be sensitive to those of us that get really sensitive to political talk, but I absolutely love the fact that what Jesus does here is abandons the crowd. That's funny to me. This is when he abandons the crowd. It takes off. He abandons them because they're about to make him their famous political leader. They, they, they're completely ignorant. Listen, they're completely ignorant of the fact that they believe that political change is going to bring about the satisfaction that their hearts long for. Just... Wrap your mind around what I just said. That's what they believe. Political change is going to bring about the satisfaction that my heart longs for. These people in this text, they're not truly interested in having a Savior who can satisfy their every hunger. They're interested in, in electing an earthly king who could change their immediate circumstances. And honestly, who could blame them? Really? I'm not just throwing stones here. Who can blame them? I'm in this crowd. Jews have been living under the oppressive rule of another nation since roughly the days of the judges, right after the book of Joshua, maybe a thousand years now. Their nation was severely fractured. Even the religious crowd who claimed to follow God, they were severely divided. <coughs> there were at least four major camps in Judaism during that day. They're starving for change in their nation. They mistakenly seek to make Jesus their political king. They failed to see that true contentment is not the result of physical food or earthly political kings. Listen, you go to the next text after this, and here's what you find. The bread of life has just nourished their stomachs miraculously. So surely this same bread of life could have satisfied the deepest Longings of their souls. But they learn to live on every word from the mouth of God. I think the people in the crowd uh, probably would have told you that they loved God. Probably would have told you that they believed that Jesus would satisfy their hunger for national change if they could just get him into office. Pretty sure that's what they would have told you. If I was there, that's what I would have told you. And the reality of this text is that Jesus is the only one who can satisfy our hunger eternally. So what are you running to for satisfaction? What do you hunger for the most right now? What are you aware of that you really desire? Let me flip that on its head and ask it this way. Where are you aware of resistance inside of you to the things that I've said today? Because oftentimes, that's the place we need to go to. The place where I'm just resisting. I'm just, oh, I can't get on board with that, right? It could be that your deepest hunger actually exists in the same room in your soul as your deepest resistance. Because deep resistance, deep pain also creates deep hunger. So where, where, where is your deepest pain? Where is your deepest resistance? That's where you're going to find some of your deepest hunger. I mean, the implication that you may have a little uh, religious hypocrite running around inside of you, that might make you angry. That might be a good place to start then. Cause you maybe want to justify yourself, get your list out, start working your way through them. Possible that you've traded the bread of life for a circus attraction. Possible that you've spiritualized your longings for national change to make your idols seem more palatable. Now, I admit that these are tough questions. I wrestle with these questions. Hard to admit that my heart is more prone to legalism and attraction and physical results than it is to real transformation in the presence of Jesus. So it's good for me to be reminded, good for you to be reminded 
that Jesus is the only one who can satisfy my hunger eternally. The way I think we apply this as we conclude and close down uh, for today is just to be reminded that John's gospel was written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, Son of God, and that by believing you may have eternal life in his name. That's John 20, 31. I would be remiss if I were to invite you to a neat and tidy list of ways that you could please God or change the world. The only thing I feel impressed to do with you this morning is to invite you into the presence of Jesus, who is our healer and our bread of life. So the question is, will you, will you join me there? Will you join me in, in a place um, that's called Golgotha? It's called the place of a skull. This is where Jesus, uh, in his perfection, went and died horribly for you and for me. And his blood was poured out and his body was broken. That's the place that I think we ought to kneel down at. The foot of that bloody cross, the doorway of an empty tomb, holding on to a love letter that says, I'm coming back for you. You're not left in this existence. I'm coming back for you and I'm going to set everything right. And the proof of that in this love letter is the truth of the cross and the truth of the empty tomb. This is where our hope lies. This is where our joy lies. And this is our ultimate destiny. A hope in the empty tomb. A trust in the joy of the cross. And I rest in the promise of heaven. Will you join me there as you think about and ponder and give room for the Spirit to point out the places of your life where you've been walking as a lame person, and where you've been feeding your hungers in sinful, unhealthy ways. And let Jesus meet you at the cross in the doorway of the empty tomb and with the hope of heaven. And let him do a work on your heart of reconciliation and restoration and healing and satisfaction. Because that's what he's promised to do. So I invite you to meet me there. Let's pray. Jesus, I ask that you would meet us in our deep places of hunger and our deep places of pain and hurt and longing and sin and rebellion and hard-heartedness. You would soften our hearts, give us brand new hearts, heal us, we ask. Help us to trust you and to love you and to find our rest in you. In Jesus' name, amen.